Hello everyone, welcome back to New Dogs Old Tricks. It's been quite a while, you know, we've actually been very, very busy uh, with a lot of stuff, you know, and we've been very disorganised as well, actually. But uh, we're glad to be back, and today we're going to be talking about political systems, as we promised to do in the last episode. Back in um, July, or whenever it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a, a very long time ago, but let's just completely forget about that. You know, we hope to get back on, on track and do more pod, uh, podcasts, you know, on a regular basis. So... Uh, today we're going to be going through political systems and uh, first of all we're going to be going through the history of political systems, how they progress through time from you know the prehistoric era to now. We're going to be going uh, through power sources in politics. And we're going to be going through um, uh, things like um, so uh, sources of power, economic systems. Forms um, of government. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, you'll, many more things, you know, I haven't covered it all there, but we will talk about it. So, Tom, would you like to say anything? I'd like to say lots of things. Hello back, dear listeners, all about two of you. Um, no, well, we're <laughs> going to do better this time. We're going to do better this time. Um, well, it's been a while, obviously. Um, various things conflicted, and obviously, we've been, well, we've been back at school, so that's been a little bit of a busy thing. Um, but... Yes, yeah, so we'll be doing political systems and forms of government and so on, and some nitty gritty stuff about how governments actually work in the modern age. But there's also a fair degree of philosophy in there. So I think this episode might be one of the more, uh, one of the less philosophical and more kind of practical ones, and it yeah. with a large focus on history and so on. Um, mm. But hopefully you should enjoy it anyway, and we'll get on with going, getting on, I suppose. Right, so. Sully, I know you have made a vast quantity of notes on this, so can you tell us a little bit about the evolution history of political systems? Okay, yeah. So, um, politics started, well, political, well, just society, you know, in, in terms of governance, at least, because that's what we're talking about when we're talking about politics, we're talking about governance. Um, at the very beginning, we had sort of forms of tribal governance, Um because you know that we weren't that uh, well given at the beginning, but we needed to survive, so we'd go around foraging, and we would um, have hunter-gatherer societies essentially. But and we had that for a very long time, and it, they were essentially gift economies. So what would happen is everyone would gather um, for resources in a, hunt, a hunter-gatherer uh, tribal society, and they'd share these resources between each other. Now. As the as we came around to the times of the agricultural revolution, we started to settle ourselves because we realised that we could stay in one place and perform farming, and that actually drastically changed the um, the way in which we did society. And as we settled down, we started to delegate roles in society. For example, we started to delegate. Oh, these are the people who are going to go and do the agriculture for us, and do the farming, and they're going to provide essentially the resources for us to live. And then we can go off and do our own things, and that's just, and then that created divisions of labour within society, and that sort of started that sort that sort of started off the principles of civilization, um, and, and, because not but, oh, yeah because sorry. not everyone had to spend their time gathering food and drink essentially, uh, and that led to uh, you know early forms of markets as well. And if you want to go on, Tom. Well, I was just going to say, well, that obviously took place with a vast quantity of violence. Um, because for some reason the hunter gatherers who, you know, ate what they needed and lived ar around and, um, you know, only worked you know, a very small number of hours a day or a week or so on, weren't <coughs> sorry so much fans of being forced to stay on one bit of land and farm for tens of hours a day because it was. It, it did become that way, and they were working a lot more by um, compared to what they had been when they were hunter gathering. So that required a lot of violence um, in order to push that through. As did the the fact that we had for the first time in history a surplus um, of resources, because you know we're now not just consuming as much or as little as we want. We're now actually um, uh, producing more than we need just as, as, as humans, um, that was also a very violent thing. Who was going to get that? Um, and qu well, quite often it was the kings and the tribal leaders and so on, whilst the rest continued to toil away 
um, just and just receiving enough to get by. Um, so I suppose that's a kind of key element to re remember to get that in there. And um, I would also add, there's a kind of cognitive aspect to it as well. Sorry, I've got a little bit of cough at the moment, as you might be able to tell. Yeah. Um, the fact was that humans, in our separation from other Homo species like Homo neanderthalis and um, the various other um, hominids, um, we experienced what many call a cognitive revolution, where for the first time we could communicate with thing with language that doesn't just purely address the the physical world around us. So we could talk about broader ideals like government or society and so on, which uh, are fundamentally different to things like tree or, I don't know, um, yeah. mammoth and so on. And that was another key aspect in us being able to build up these political and social organisations because we could have myths and beliefs that connected us and get, sent to us the... Um, the impetus to work. Very well spoken, Tom. Okay. <laughs> what, what a random line. Anyway, um, yeah. So, you might wonder, how did we move from, you know, those in initial inequalities uh, in the, you know, deciding who gets the surplus? How did we move from those to complex economies or um, collapse, coll um, complex political systems? And well, because we can actually see that throughout history and the development as cities that didn't have certain resources uh, would actually have to uh, engage with other re uh, cities nearby. And that's actually how we started the first forms of trade. And that's how we started alliances between um, cities. And that's how actually cities built up into greater um, you know, political structures and governments. And the actual uh, political notion of, the, of like a centralized state actually started to come around through um, essentially people trading resources for military protection, uh, which was uh, pretty common. In addition, uh, what actually happened is, as labour specialised, some of the projects required um, required a lot of centralisation of um, coordination, and this allowed the, the government to centralise itself more during these periods. And as all these things continue to centralise and as trade continues to develop, we started to see a more and more complex economy, which did involve the exploitation of, of labour, you know, uh, land relationships, the rise of militaries. And that's how we start to see some civilizations, um, you know, the rise of what we call civilization nowadays. Um, for example, as you, as you developed, you actually got to, um, for example, the ancient Greeks who had a very complex uh, political system of direct democracy, actually, that we'll talk about later. And it's very interesting to see how, as we moved from having labour surplus, we had more time to think about politics and think about our power structures. And that's how we started to get the first few formally um, organised political systems. Brilliant. Uh, Tom, do you, have, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I suppose I would add um, that... So, like, I would go on a little bit from you and say we got the first um, the empires and so on um, from the, the Greek and the Roman models that followed there. And, and there were plenty around the world as well, in India and um, South America and places. Um, and we, we also got further first questions of church and state, which, was a, which is and is to this day a huge part of especially um, English, Ang Anglo, so American and British, um, and of, to be honest, all of Europe, um, is one of the biggest issues uh, to political systems today, is to what extent do we separate the church from the state, um, especially with the rise of Christianity and Rome and so on. And that, that uh, you know, if you, if you live in a society where everyone believes in a god, that is the supreme source of all authority, and how do you reconcile that with the, you know, the, the specific persons who wield political power in the age in which you live in? Um, is there, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, um, is there any particular uh, way of reconciling those two things, and 
formalizing them and and should we separate them or should they be entwined together and that was kind of an important uh, issue that was key to the rest of development um but then after that you kind of got the moments of feudal states if you've got anything on that sully yeah um yeah, the the feudal uh, the feudal states is, is very interesting to talk about. So during the medieval era, um, we actually generally saw an ec- a, a sort of political system that we that we now characterise as a feudalism. And a mistake a lot of people make when they talk about feudalism actually is that they assume feudalism is or was some formalised political system that people spent a lot of time you know thinking about and refining through political philosophy. And the reality is. When we talk about feudalism, it's actually just a generalization of, you know, the landowning relationships we saw within the medieval era. And what we kind of saw was um, feudalism was a massive sort of decentralization of political structures, which occurred because during the Middle Ages, there was a lot of um, the, the power of in regions actually diminished a lot, which led to decentralization of power. And it led to these sort of... Um, you know, it led to the feudal system. And during the feudal era, there was a lot of social inequality as you had the people, of course, who, um, who owned the land and then you had the people, the relationships between them and the people who had to work on the land and everything. And you're obviously way better versed in feudalism than me. So I'd, I'd, I'd probably hand, hand it to you to talk about the nature of feudalism. Uh, and I'll talk about it later, actually, the how, how feudalism came to an end, actually, if you, if you want to talk about feudalism. Well, I, yeah, I, I'm happy to talk a little bit about it. I, I suppose... Um, like you were saying, the, there was a loss of a centralized state. Um, there, there were still holdovers from years gone by, but it was actually um, the contradictions within feudalism that led to um, less and less power being with the king and some sort of centralized authority. You know, back in London or wherever the capital was at the time of the various countries in which they lived. For instance, in Britain, it was under the feudal times. That you got the as as, a, as they got the first kind of emergencies of of land as being the the proper source of power, and you got the Magna Carta and the barons constricting the power of the king, which was kind of a unheard of thing, um, since Rome and the kind of the dominance of unelected dictatorships um, throughout the whole of the Western world. So the fact that um, there was now an alternative uh, power base um, was pretty pretty essential to the later development of uh, political thought and, and the fact that there was now people who actually had a say in the king's actions um, has had a dramatic impact up to this day on um, the way in which our, our political systems are, are, are run. For instance, the Magna Carta gave the baron, the king created the world's first parliament effectively, um, which were, had powers to limit the king and decide for him what the actions for the country were. Um, so it was the fact that production um, of goods was now taking place not in cities and uh, you know, centres like it had been done under perhaps the Romans and the Greeks in their slave states, uh, but was now being handled countrywide in countryside areas. That meant that you got this new change in the political system that favoured land, land basically, as the source of power and gave rise to various political institutions and ones that we still hold today, like the Magna Carta, um, which has had a huge impact worldwide um, on, on the British legal and political system, on the American one, and and, and, and many others that have looked at the, the values espoused through that document, which wasn't even like an amazing democratic document. Um, you know, it, it just meant that landowners as well as the king could have a little bit of a say um but it's it's importance again nonetheless cannot really be understated no overstated sorry <laughs> right do you want to add anything yeah, yeah. else no yeah um the discussion of the magna carta is actually very important it'll be it'll be very useful later on actually in this history section because what you'll find is the the, the fall of feudalism started to happen as the the sort of economic development under feudalism um, essentially provided the economic opportunities for the unification of power to occur again, for one person, this autocrat of the king, to take the power back. 
And the reason the, that feudalism actually, you know, uh, faded out of existence generally is that the king began to win um, disputes and fights against these feudal lords. And as such, power beca bega began to, be uh, to become more and more centralized back into this autocrat. And you actually saw after the feudal system, a lot of um, countries succumbed to autocracies led by mo monarchs that you'll, you we were talking about before the, you know, the, the unity of state and religion actually a lot, uh, you know, for our history and these autocratic monarchs who justified themselves through the divine rule of kings that we'll talk about later, etc. Uh, and um, yeah, we saw feudalism fade away in a lot of states because the kings got their power back and centralized it all. But you might ask, how did we move from an autocratic era then to modern capitalism? Well, and that actually occurred. May I just because... may I just interject there for a second? So go ahead, go ahead. I think it's important to mention the kind of change in economics that led to that recentralization of power. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it was things like global trade, um, which never really happened before, right? In the medieval medieval ages, or if it did, was very small and centered in a few commodities. Um, but the growth of things like the world trade and then the expansion into America in uh, from Spain and so on meant that the king could now exercise his powers more clearly because, the, you know, these were no longer um, land-based solely uh, issues and they were ones which were more to do with the actual structure of the state itself, a thing that was still held very strongly by the king. Um, so you get the growth back, as you said, towards some more centralization of power and growth of autocracy. And, and please continue onwards, Sully. No, oh, yeah, that was a very important um, yeah, clarification because people might wonder how economically could that actually happen? How did the kings get their power back uh, to, to, you know, to win these disputes? But yeah, essentially what we saw was as the kings began centralized again, we had these autocracies. Um, there, there, we, there is a period in history between this, um, these autocracies after feudalism and now, which is capitalism, and that's where come, that's where the whole mercantile system actually comes in. And essentially, we saw a massive change in the economic structure of, of society, as we had what we, what essentially, what some people call crony capitalism or the mercant, uh, mercantilism, which was a an early form of, of. Um, of economic theory just before capitalism and uh did you want to talk about mercantilism because i i i i don't i can't really speak that well about mercantilism i'm not that well informed about it well i i think mercantilism is very important in the way in which it changed the nature of production as an intermediary step between as you say feudalism and capitalism um so mercantilism is a is the the kind of result of a view of society that's very based around kings and lords and land and so on and the the, the nation as being the most important thing and the growth in private enterprise which was happening at the same time so it was the idea that nations the the, the economy the world economy was a zero sum game that if one nation lost the other one would gain um somewhere else and so on um so the aim was for um, every country to try and scrape back as much as it could through you know, protectionism, um, uh, the, the proper industrialization as it was at the time. So, you know, agricultural mostly, but also in small scale manufacturing of all the land so that they could properly, properly build up their stocks of gold and silver and they wanted to reduce imports and so on. And and as well, it gave way to the rise in colonization um, because you couldn't let your competitors, the other nations, use some of the resources and the, the land and the people there against you. Um, and, and the fact that it was been done through that mechanism, again, leads to the growth in the power of the state, um, which was the backer of the violence perpetrated by uh, the co colonialists, although often that was uh, done by private companies like the East India Company or so on in Britain and, and things like that, it was nonetheless reinforced by the growing, the, the, by the power that the state had over that. But the state was beginning slowly to see that power through the growth of those very same private um, enterprises and so on. 
Um, but mercantilism was a very interesting period, but I suppose what's more interesting is how that developed into capitalism and the first roots of the liberal economic and political system we bear today. So, Sully? Yeah, so essentially that was an era of mercantilism. And during that era, you had mercantilism and you also had nationalism um, to some extent. And that is actually, they, they were intertwined in many cases, as, as we saw, in as you talked about, in um, colonialism and the colonial effort. Um, and that, and essentially what mercantilism did to, to allow for the rise of capitalism was the economic development that people saw under the um, the imperialism of mercantilism. And what that, the resources under mercantilism allowed for was the Industrial Revolution. And with the Industrial Revolution, um, society started to reorganise itself a lot. M under mercantilism, you had, you know, the relationship of the main, the, the big things in society, the big sort of entity are the merchants. But under the, the Industrial Revolution, what started to happen was the main class of people who had power politically and economically um, after the Industrial Revolution were those who owned you know, industry, those who owned the factories, those who drove capitalist innovation. And so that actually solidified the division of labor into those who own, you know, these industrial, the, the processes required for um, industrial, you know, uh, production, aka what we now call the means of production, and those who have to work for a wage. And so that established what we call the capitalist mode of production um, for profit. And, well, it's always been for profit to some extent, but it established what we call capitalism. And then you obviously had globalization, which carried capitalism across the world. And alongside all of this, you also might ask, OK, so capitalism has come into play. But how did modern dem democracy come into play? Which is the focus of this and that's episode, also very, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And um, essentially, from my understanding of it, the uh, when we talked about the Magna Carta before, What's very interesting is that not all countries completely, um, you know, fell to autocracy after feudalism. Some countries, such as the UK, had made concessions to um, the barons and lords, whatever else, through things like the Magna Carta, which provided a parliament which restricted the king's power in accordance to the desires of these, uh, uh, into the, the, you know, as per the the rules of the parliament. And these parliaments over time, during this period, as capitalism developed, became stronger and stronger, passing more and more rights, uh, more, more and more rights bills, sorry. And this sort of started to uh, weaken the power of these, these, these monarchs. And eventually we saw the rise of modern representative democracy. Uh, and that was carried across the world through um, globalization as well, through imperialism to some extent, and as well through the plurality proliferation is that the right proliferation. word proliferation yeah of essentially what we call liberal philosophy which is what drives our modern liberal uh, democracy so yeah that's essentially what happened if you want if you want to talk about uh, democracy and the liberal philosophy or anything so i suppose um by the kind of 17th and 18th um and, sorry 18th and 19th centuries 17th 18th 19th and so on those centuries, uh, I'm not being very clear today, um, you kind of got the emergence of a contradiction between the state having unlimited power and uh, the growth of private enterprise and that being the, the biggest source of wealth um, beyond land, um, which had been dominant for thousands of years, essentially. Um, so you've got the emergence of new schools of thinking from that kind of contradiction. And those were the likes of John Locke, um, J John Stuart Mill, Bentham and so on. And they provided various different ways of thinking about the way the state interacted with the community um, and had dramatic impact across the whole world, as you said. And often that was largely um, done through um brutal colonization project <coughs> there apologies um but it was nonetheless pretty um it, it, yeah, sorry losing my train of thought there a little bit um it it, it they, they did have a dramatic impact and they were they were they are still often 
there's good and bad things about them essentially um so um if we want to talk uh, about yeah. um i mean Locke's theory of natural rights was really important to the american constitution um in guaranteeing people you know the famous thing people have a right to health happiness and um health no life and the pursuit of happiness apologies there yeah um and that that was kind of key both here and in, and both in America and here and in Britain as well. You've got the growth and the power of the uh, of capitalists, and you've got things like the Great Reform Act coming through, which was essentially our version of Marx's bourgeois revolutions. Except it wasn't a revolution, obviously; it was just an act of Parliament. But after years of political agitation, and that paved the way for. Um, capitalists having a role in the way society was run which was essentially what that law that law meant rather than just letting landowners do whatever they want um since they were the only ones who could vote for instance um but the fact that that came into effect it kind of paved the way for modern views of, of human rights and democracy being based around um the, the the conception of man that was developed by the liberal thinkers at that time, um, gone. Sorry. Yeah. Oh no. Um. Yeah. That's that's completely right. And, um, the liberal philosophy actually, yeah, very much drove um, the the modern capitalist movement. And not only did Locke talk about a, pro, a, a light, a, sorry, a right to life, but he also talked a lot about the right to private property. And he had a lot of um, ideas about how if if one worked on a certain piece of land, they they, ha- they were entitled to privately owning that land. And these these sort of ideas, um, he sort of developed into our modern notions of capitalism and, and reinforced it. And so we can actually see the interactions between politics and philosophy, um, very heavily there. And the question our viewers might be asking though is from there, how do we reach modern principles of for, for example, you know, nationalised um, systems. It's not nationalised systems, sorry. How do you reach, like, nationalised resources, stuff like, you know, nationalised healthcare? And that actually occurred because there was a lot of backlash against against the process of capitalism by people like, um, by, by like Marx and these other anti-capitalist socialist philosophers. And what you saw in the 20th century was a lot of people were fed up at inequality some of which was actually caused by this new capitalistic system as well. And, and reinforced so by engage... the political system, which didn't offer people, a, exactly. a, 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 the last quantity of people across the world, uh, any say in it whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. Go on. Um, exactly. So people were fed up of not having any political power because, you know, for the past, since the since the, the start of divisions of labour after the tribal societies, people have been, you know, in positions of exploitation. And so people engaged in, you know, what we now refer to historically as, for example, the Russian revolutions, and they wanted a new socialistic approach to the economy. And during that era, you obviously saw the, you know, the, the, all these socialist revolutions, but many people didn't actually believe that these authoritarian revolutions that later turned out to actually not properly work were actually the way to socialism. And so you had a lot of actually liberal socialist thinkers, economists like Keynes or whatever, um, who essentially drove new ideas in, in capitalism itself, saying, hey, maybe the state should interfere a bit with the economy and you know, should provide some resources to prevent us from all just being constantly exploited by uh, by the capitalists. You know, if, for example, you might look to America nowadays, the entire healthcare system is privatized. And so what this actually leads to is um, most people are getting ripped off constantly um, when trying to get something as simple as a basic right, something like healthcare. They're paying thousands for stuff we pay f- essentially very little for. You know, we pay in taxes in the UK. And a lot of people thought maybe, you know, some parts of the economy should not be in the hands of just seeking profit. It should be in the hands of the government to make sure that the 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 economy appeals to the needs of the people. And that's how we led to, you know, modern social, social, socially democratic thinking, ideas of the ideas of nationalization and public uh, and public resources and social safety nets and, and all of that. If, yeah, I'm, you're very well versed and can you, uh, 
you know, Keynes's ideas and everything. Well, I'm not sure Keynes really has that much influence over political systems beyond the extension of democracy into the economy. I think, really, the key thinkers to that were not so much him as just broadly socialist and Fabian ideas from the late yeah. 19th century, which burst into a growing workers' movement by the 20th century. And, you know, that was mostly in Germany and in the UK and other bits of Europe and America, but they were more limited in their extent, mostly because they were less industrialised than we in Germany were. Um, <coughs> uh, but it was those ideas of um, worker power and democracy that kind of influenced, didn't, like, properly change the system as Marx may have wanted, but had enough... But but probably it went to the Fabian kind of um, consolidation of both liberal values such as I don't know pluralism, um, uh, uh, human rights, and the things that have been written about um, in that sense, as well as this kind of social contract theory, which we'll get onto a bit later, of the likes of Rousseau. It had a bit of a fusion with that and with socialist ideas over the socialization of wealth and uh, income and various other um, aspects of socialization of the means of production. Yeah, which is what I've just said, essentially. Um, that fed into a combination of the two of them, and you got the emergence of the modern state as something which didn't just leave the economy alone, but was actually kind of quite interventionist into it. Um, and obviously, if we look back, the state has always been interventionist in as much as it has reinforced private property relationships. But it's actually about the way it intervenes in markets and so on that was very key to the idea of the state uh, based around kind of social contract theory um, uh, and the likes of rules and so on in the 40s. Well, it depends on where you were in the world, but kind of the 40s to the 70s. That was a kind of the key way of viewing the state as the enforcer uh, of private property, but also the enforcer of um, the general welfare. Um so that's that's kind of where the economic and political side feeds into the develop the, the idea of the government. Uh, would you like to add anything more? No, no. I think you've essentially covered everything there. But um, well, I would no. I would I would add a little bit extra on the end, which would be um, the the kind of how that kind of fell apart somewhat, and the new ideas from Nozick and libertarians which argue for a shrinking of the state. And today you kind of have a mixed, a very mixed idea of what the state should be and what government should do. Um, because you've still got a yeah. lot of people expressing the kind of innate belief that the state should look after its citizens. But at the same time, you've got them also advocating for um, minimal states as Nozick and so on would have preferred. So you, I, I'd say at this time, and, and even back in the 60s and 40s and so on, it was still very up in the air. But at this time, I'd say our idea of what the modern state should encompass is very, very mixed, as is shown by the kind of the, the, the polarisation that we have in lots of our politics today. So I don't know, Bernie Sanders' view of what the government is for is very different to Donald Trump's in America, or Jeremy Corbyn versus Boris Johnson. And though I think that a lot of more people are coming back to the old view of social contract theory as the basis for how the state should govern. Um, I think that you can still, uh, we're still in quite a muddled phase ideologically. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we definitely had a lot of, because we definitely had a rejection of ideals of, of state interventionism during, you know, like during like the, the Thatcher era or during like the Reagan era with um, ideas of trickle trickle down economics and even since then we've had a lot of political instability around all of this this you know constant change we've had a lot of economic change in the past 100 years and yeah even today people aren't properly set on how the, the state should govern and actually a lot of people have become you know disheartened in politics because a lot of exploited communities that haven't seen lots of change to uh, empower them in recent years have actually just completely given up on on politics uh, and giving up on the political system and, and voting and, and caring about it all. So it's very, it's very, um, it's very interesting and quite saddening also sometimes to look at how, you know, how disjuncted 
perhaps modern politics is in regard in regards to economic principles or social principles or whatever else yeah yeah i i think that's that's kind of key we are we are all a lot of us uh, exist in very separate worlds about the way in which we view um the role of the state and uh, will we ever be able to reconcile those things i don't know but I think we've kind of covered the kind of the general overview, and this is a very general thing. And I'm sure you, there's probably people that can pick apart the precise language we use throughout there. But we've kind of gone through the overview of what the state is and has been throughout history. Um, so I suppose what we can talk about now is the where states draw their power from. Unless you've got anything else to add, but I don't think. Uh. Um, I don't think there's anything else to add, really. Well, there's obviously more history anyone yeah. else can feel free to read up on, but uh, I think we've done a decent summary. Um, but I think, yeah, it's time to move on to political power sources. Fantastic. Um, so, on our notes, we've got um, democracy down first. Um, so, democracy is the predominant system of, well, the predominant source of power... <coughs> through the west um uh, the west i'd say uh, and there's other bits you know india and so on um uh but it's it's the kind of view from our from the perspective of europeans and brits as to what is the best justification for where states get their power from and why they should be able to act um so what is democracy so like um, so democracy is essentially the idea that the ruling of a country should be centered around the the needs and desires of the people rather than some of the ruling force. You know, before the rise of modern democracy, you you had a lot of rule by an autocrat, by some guy at the top who you know said what was best for everyone else, and people felt very dissatisfied that they weren't being represented properly. You know, like for example, someone may be gay. And the government says, oh, you can't be gay. But then they're like, Wait, I, I, I would like to be gay. I would like to be represented politically. And there were a lot of desires like this. And essentially, we sort of started to realise that the best way to conduct society was if we're going to be governing society with a massive amount of people, maybe that massive amount of people should be the ones deciding what's best for that amount of people. You know, it comes from this liberal idea that we need the consent of the governed. Um, those who are being governed by the state should have a say in how the the state governs them, and so democracy essentially breaks down into to two forms. So we have direct democracy and we have representative democracy, and representative democracy is essentially what we see most of the well, essentially in pretty much every single democratic uh, state in the world. Direct democracy was seen, you know, in the past in, for example, uh, ancient Greece. And it is seen in some circumstances, like in Switzerland or in parts of America, in like very specific circumstances. But direct democracy, just you don't see it that often nowadays. Um, even though it is political, you know, sort of philosophy for democracy. But do you want me, should, I, should we go into um, specifically what direct and representative democracy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so direct democracy is a form of democracy wherein the electorate, um, and I say electorate because not everyone can vote in a democracy um you know children generally can't vote in democracy um just because we think they don't have you know the rationality required to properly make political decisions but a, demo- a direct democracy is essentially a form of democracy wherein the electorate um directly decides policy initiatives and directly is involved uh, in the political system so they so you know people on um local levels have the power to make laws they have the power to, they have the power to elect and recall officials they have the power to call for trials to occur legally they have the power to directly pass executive decisions after deliberation after deliberation and this sort of democratic approach is essentially built from for what uh, many dem- directly democratic thinkers such as uh, Rousseau actually um they uh, they saw this as a as a sort of you know they they prefer this form of democracy because they like it on a local level the idea of deliberating and um building up the the government from these local institutions of of deliberation and direct participation in democracy um and yeah so essentially direct democracy is this idea that on a local level we should have a lot of um, local influence in democracy uh, with people having direct power in the democ- in the political system and build it up from there 
but a lot of people saw issues with this direct democracy and the fact that um, it requires a lot of work on a local level. Not everyone can spend all their time you know, engaging in politics. And this whole idea led to the rise of a sort of representative democracy, wherein, you know, most people don't spend their time thinking about politics. So instead, what we're going to do is, you know, every four, every five years, you know, we're going to elect some guy to represent us for our community. And he'll do the politics stuff for us and he'll generally handle it all for us. And we'll have some says, we'll have stuff like referendums, as we have in the UK sometimes. Uh, you know, in America, there'll be there'll be sometimes <coughs> policy initiatives that you'll see in some states. There will be some direct inter uh, uh, direct elements that you see in representative democracy sometimes. But generally, let's, you know, elect people to do the politics for us and they can represent it for us. And it's much more... It's, it's been seen as a much more stable solution to, to running a country democratically while still, you know, making sure that the needs of the people are represented. Um, and in this, uh, as well as, you know, in representative democracies, not everything has to be purely run, you know, uh, by the people at all times. So in modern representative democracies, we've actually seen elements of bureaucracy as well, you know, um, but we can get onto that later. Um, uh, if you want anything to add, Tom. No, I think that was a pretty good summary. Um, I, 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 yeah, I think, I think the the kind of the the debate between direct, which is kind of the purest form of democracy, and representative, is pretty important, and we can have a little discussion between ourselves later. I think um, because we have differing opinions on that. But well, let's get on to the other forms of power source, and these I think we'll go a little bit less in detail about. Um, so you've got things like autocracies, where political power is centred into one person's hands. Um, so that's something like I don't know, Tsarist Russia, um, where you've got one individual, the Tsar, who, according to the Russian Orthodox Church, was the the the, the face of God on earth, the, the representative God on earth, and thus was the one that was in charge of making um, decisions and was key and was the only one that really had the authority to um, to make political decisions um uh, whereas um and that differs slightly from uh something like a a, a, a broader general dictatorship or oligarchy because that can involve multiple people having an influence for example china at the moment with the chinese communist party um it's not just xi jinping that controls power although i don't know if, if you read about it i'm sure you'll argue that he does have more much more power than is originally intended to um, but there is one group of unelected officials that control political power, and they are where, um, from where uh, the governments govern, essentially. Um, so you can have, you can have a kind of hybrids between the two. For example, you've got some degree of, um, democracy in, uh, in the USSR, for instance, especially around workplace as well. With the but the broader system was fairly authoritarian with a form of dictatorship where the Russian, no, the, not the Russian, they did the 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 Soviet Communist Party, um, was had the monopoly over political power, um, uh, and and then you can find various variants between them, them, them. um, but that, I think that's a broad summary, um, and there there are different justifications for them, so. Uh, the, the democracy is fairly easy to justify. Um, well, I, I, I'm not, I, perhaps I retract that. It's not amazingly easy to justify, but it is pretty universally held that the people who are being ruled over should have a say in how they are ruled over. And, and there doesn't seem to be too much that's objectionable about that. Um, but there are still people, even today, that defend things like autocracy and oligarchy. So, I mean, if we go back to the ideas of um, Aristotle and Plato, Plato believed in a race of, not a race even, a group of philosopher kings that should be in charge of um, the way society is run, since philosophers are the ones that have had their minds open and, uh, you know, can see out of Plato's cave, as it were, to use the old, um, uh, this, this old analogy. Um, Aristotle, uh, similarly, felt uh, that the best form of government was not a democracy, which he saw as mob rule, but rather was uh, one which there was a benevolent dictator uh, who had the interests of the country at heart and would follow through on them. And 
arguing like that is often based on a like a pragmatic level. Yes, that yes, democracies may you know have some benefits um, socially and uh, philosophically, but um, it's only dictatorships or whatever that can really deal on the issues for people because democracies will be too hamstrung with the conflicting desires and so on. And that and that's while well, social contract theory um, has often been used to defend a democracy. Um, I mean, the kind of originator Rousseau um, was not 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 like a pro democracy person. He still favoured an uh, an aristocratic or um, uh, or autocratic system of government, provided that it worked for the interests of the society's members. Um, so, have you got anything else to add, Sully? Um, uh, I was going to say, just wanted to add an extra section, maybe talk about something. Um, just like I, I, I would just ask you, because as far as I'm aware, Rousseau, while he did talk about philosopher kings, I do think later on he talked about how he did prefer the ideas of direct democracy, and he was one actually one of the driving thinkers in the development of modern directly democratic theory. So I will have to resolve that another time and discuss um, what the history of that actually is. But uh, let's go on to something else I was going to talk about, which is, I think, another interesting thing to talk about in this section of power sources, actually, would be to talk about oligarchies, uh, which are essentially this idea of rule by the few. And you might ask, oh, uh, rule rule by the few. So do you mean like a, you mean like a one-party state? Or do you mean like, you know, a dictatorship? And actually, no. So oligarchy is, is a bit different to that in the sense that it's sort of like a group of individuals who um, behind the scenes have a lot of political influence, even if even though it's not explicitly stated at times. And we see that actually in the modern world as, you know, political thinkers such as Noam Chomsky might say that our current society is an oligarchy because, and, and not even just an oligarchy, specifically what we call a, um, a plutocracy, wherein the people with the most power are actually the people with the most money and and so power has become concentrated in the power in the in the hands of the wealthy rather than just really in the power in the hands of the the people and so our democracy has always been tainted by forms of oligarchy wherein influence through ownership of of wealth or um ownership of land or other things that can be exploited for personal gain has sort of corrupted our democracy yeah, I mean, yeah. So the original meaning of oligarchy um, was uh, kind of a group of people, but yeah, I think its current usage is, as, as you say, um, often about the kind of back behind the scenes um, subversion of democracy. Um, and, and yeah, coming back to the Rousseau point, yes, I can understand. Actually, he 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 was in favour of some degree of democracy, and he thought that the general will, which was his idea of um, of what states should pursue should be decided through voting. But then aside from the regular inter- intervals in which that was decided, it should be run fairly autocratically. Um, his model was based off the kind of Swiss cantons model, which which you mentioned before, where there's quite a lot of referenda. And even though that, that it's still mostly a representative democracy. Um, so I suppose we can get on to now a bit about the democracy debate between Dewey and Lippmann. So this was, <coughs> yeah. sorry, a debate that occurred in the 20th century between, it was kind of, it happened over many decades, um, and, it, and it was between, um, oh, blimey, I can't remember his first name, Dewey and Lippmann, Walter Lippmann and Robert, John, John Dewey, John Dewey, mm. kind of got to get that right. Um, <laughs> so to Lippmann, he thought that democracy could not succeed on its own terms. He thought that um, citizens of any nation, um, regardless of any nation of, of, of size that the nations currently are today, could never know enough about um, the way the world worked to actually make you know come up with their ideas and act on them and and and, and act on them in a way that would conform to the best. The, the two uh, the, the best thing for society so people may have particular opinions about how the way certain things are run but they really weren't the right ones given that 
no one can have the the, the amount of knowledge necess- necessary to um, understand, I know, the complex workings of, uh, I don't know, overseas banking or so on, um, unless you are directly involved in those occupations or that area of the economy and so on, you're going to be unable to properly deal with um, the, 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 the kind of important notions at hand. Um, so he thought that the way in which we cope with this, um, we, we don't have all the hours in the day to decide how we're going to act and politically, was to create stereotypes about the world and fit ourselves into pseudo environments, as he put them, that are too actually removed from the issues and merely just create broad brush strokes around the world. He felt the media contributed to that as well, rather than actually, um, you know, providing us with more information. Um, the media was instead just creating its own stereotypes in our head. Uh, and this is something actually I think is vaguely similar to what Baudrillard was talking about, um, in as much as we construct our own realities and we cannot really reconcile the one reality from the other, who is to say one is more or less uh, important, but they are nonetheless conflicting. Um, so here's an idea instead, and he wasn't amazingly clear with how he wanted to do this, was that you needed a specialised class of social scientific experts who operated beyond the voters and the politicians. But of course that raises its own questions. Who makes moral decisions? For instance, should these social scientific experts be focused on um, just providing the best for their nation state, or should they have some broader view of human rights or um, uh, Kantian ethics or so on? That should be the, 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 the turning point around which they focus their efforts. Um, and and obviously these these experts could be swayed. They could favour their interests rather than the interests of the general population, um, which is well, clearly not a good thing. If the whole point of this kind of I think it's called an epistocracy or a newocracy, if the whole point of that is that it would favour the citizens of the country better, it doesn't really work if those same people are now using it for their own private gain. But he was met by various rejoinders from the um, philosopher John Dewey. And if he's not John Dewey, I am going to feel like a bit of a chump after this. Um, but he was very of the, of the opinion that well, he was very optimistic in as much as we could still save democracy from the kind of worries that Lippmann was talking about. So he thought that political knowledge wasn't just something that was held directly by individuals and everyone had to know all the workings of the economy and the, the, I know, the health system and so on to make an informed choice but rather that it came about through a conversation among and between citizens he also focused on the fact that democracy unlike this epistocracy or unlike any other form before was the only thing the only form of government of only power source that you didn't need recourse to a past hierarchy to support so he made two attacks which were fundamentally about how knowledge was acquired and also about how Lippmann's preferred system would run and whether the perhaps benefits of social gains could be outweighed by the immorality in Dewey's eyes of a system that was based in unfair hierarchy. So there we go. Um, do you want to add anything, Zoli? Uh, no, yeah. that's. I think it's a very interesting issue, the democracy debate, and I think you know, I, I, I have my own opinions on, I, I, I for example, I, I definitely, most people would support democracy, actually, but I think most people struggle with perhaps justifying how it would defeat a benevolent dictator. And I think Dewey provides an excellent response to it. And also, you can, you can always go after the other responses, I think, which are stuff like, you know, the idea that a benevolent dictator, it assumes the benevolence in the name, stuff like that. Um, the idea that... Um, What's the point of society if it caters all just to these, you know, these elite experts and it constantly is treating its citizens um, like nothing and, and never appealing to their needs? And also, you know, the idea that power corrupts and, and all that. But I think the Dewey Lipman debate is a very important, um, you know, part of, of uh, political history to talk about, uh, at least in the philosoph- philosophical world. Fantastic. So um, let's go back to a bit of direct versus representative democracy, because my friend Sully here is quite a big proponent of direct democracy. So we can have a little bit of discussion here, I think, about the benefits and detriments of it. So do you want to start with why you're a fan of direct democracy? Um, 
Yeah, so it, it in terms of democracy, I have I have no issue with representative democracy, and I think actually it could it could be very much improved to some extent by um take you know taking taking out some of like perhaps uh, corporate influence on media to to allow for people to actually have more um political power within the representative sphere. I just to me at least the essence of democracy I feel is captured better in direct democracy with local deliberations about issues and properly making sure we have power on a local level. And when I feel there's an intermediary, like a rep representative within representative democracy, um, I feel like some of the needs of the people fail to be met, um, especially when there isn't a system of recall that can be used to bring back someone who isn't properly representing the community. And I also feel like in our modern era, a lot of people have fallen out of, you know, a lot of people have gone are not content with politics anymore, and they don't want to talk about politics anymore because it never, it never, it, it, you know, they don't feel represented on a local level. They don't feel like their issues are being heard. I feel like direct democracy would very much solve that issue because everyone, you know, as many people as possible on a local level would come together to deliberate issues, and they would be able to make policy initiatives and discuss, you know, what the issues of their community are. And be able to propose solutions to them, and, and uh, you know, elect officials, and you know, I think the the element of direct participation with the democratic process, without an intermediary, actually allows people to almost represent themselves better than someone else would represent them. Well, I I can understand your point there, but I suppose my rejoinder to that would be, the, well, I I don't necessarily think that it would increase political participation, because, frankly, the way I I see direct democracy would be that it would be a very bureaucratic thing with a lot of meetings and discussions and so on that could be quite off-putting especially if you're working hard all day long and that actually coming to the table and, and throwing out these issues would be quite a, 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 a kind of upsetting process as well so until we have kind of a period of super abundance when we can just sit around discussing philosophy and politics all day long um, living comfortably met by our robot servants. I'm not sure we can really um, escape the fact that we do need a class of educated s servants to the people who can spend their whole time discussing how our needs are met. And and I do think a strong system of recall is needed um, for them. But I think that trying to trying to instead um, replace them with just like some sort of the few the concentration of people's interests into one body um is likely to provoke a an endless bureaucracy and b just general conflict and lack of resolution um i know i understand that that things can be quite um uh, things can be quite uh can be, can be worked on yeah perhaps easier more easily with through um a direct democratic system but i think that the level of disconnection that some that legislators have perhaps from some issues gives them some more degree of objectivity when coming to the decisions um and i i think that's important as well i mean i'm not like a massive flag bearer for standard bearer even for representative democracy but i think it has its benefits um above direct democracy and i i think i would still continue to support it in the present world uh, rather than a move to a direct democratic system right away um yeah i mean i i i wouldn't I, I would definitely agree that it would be very it could be very impractical under our current system to you know instantly move to a directly democratic process which is actually why i'd be more in favor of a semi -dem direct democracy with elements of recall, um, you know, or referendums or policy initiatives at times, while still having a representative system, because I think they are more practical under a current situation and allow for more freedoms when needed. Um, so yes, I, I do think there'll be an issue of implementing direct democracy under the current system. But what you'll find generally is that advocacy for direct democracy nowadays, at least, is um, heavily tied to, to the libertarian socialist movement, um, where there's sort of, there's an intertwinement of direct democracy with um, creating an economic system that properly appeals locally to the needs of the people. And so with the whole, you know, 
at least libertarian socialist thinkers would would say that um with the way that the economy changes under such circumstances a lot of people would have more free time and have a lot more liberty and something like a you know monthly council meeting to discuss the political issues of their community while also then sending off you know some experts to do it and um to deal with it all while still making sure that the people have the power on the initiatives themselves at least before they handle it hand it to the uh, the experts um i would say perhaps could be more feasible but i am open to using either system i think both have the merits and representative democracy has been very effective in the, the modern world yeah i i yeah i think i think some sort of hybrid between the two is perhaps the best way so i think we've essentially uh, agreed um <laughs> and we probably ought to move on anyway um yeah so what was next on our list of things to cover brilliant forms of government um right have you got anything specifically to say about that Sully, or shall i take um 